Hello, I'm Harriet Shapiro, Head of Exhibitions here at the New York Society Library. I'm Kathy McGowan, Librarian for Circulation and Exhibitions. Kathy and I welcome you to the book Beautiful, Margaret Armstrong and Her Bindings, which opened January 16 in the Paluzzo Family Exhibition Gallery. Because the library is temporarily closed, we are delighted to bring our gallery talk to you through our virtual library. Before we begin, let me say that the idea and execution of the book Beautiful was the inspiration of Barbara Beek, head of special collections here at the library. It was Barbara who discovered in our collection many 19th and early 20th century books. They're ravishing covers designed by Margaret Armstrong. Who was Margaret Armstrong? She was born in 1867 and died in 1944 during World War II. Today, she stands out as one of the major artists of an almost forgotten, but no longer, chapter in the history of American book publishing, the golden age of the decorated book cover, which ran from 1890 to roughly 1915. Starting out as a young and unknown designer, Armstrong in time became one of the stars of the age of decorated book covers. When books were still bound with cloth and before the era of the color illustrated dust jacket, publishers came to realize that they could increase their sales by stamping decorative designs, not by hand, but by machine into the book cloth, cloth covers. This radical change in the fabrication of books took place as the Industrial Revolution was dramatically reshaping the production of books, no longer stitched together slowly by hand, one by one at the bindery. During Armstrong's remarkable career, more than a million books with her covers made their way into homes and libraries across America. Armstrong was thoughtfully attuned to the subject of a book for which she was designing its cover. And as you will see, she was especially fond of plant forms. Armstrong's best known work is usually associated with Art Nouveau. And today, her book covers are among the prized jewels in the library's collection. You will see for yourself that in a small space, Margaret Armstrong created works of art. Kathy and I are especially pleased to bring the book Beautiful to our members and the public at large because this exhibition also highlights the Armstrong family's long connection to our library. They were a highly artistic family and were also passionate readers. Margaret's career began, as I mentioned, when she was a young woman. In 1890, she sold her first design to the Chicago publisher, A.C. McClurg. And not unlike the Bronte sisters, Margaret and her younger sister, Helen, an illustrator and later a stained glass artist, concealed their gender when they wrote to members of the male-dominated publishing houses. For Margaret, other commissions soon followed, and by 1895, she was sufficiently established to sign her cover designs, finding a small place on each cover for her characteristic M.A. monogram. Many of her commissions came from three major publishing houses, Scribner, Putnam and Bob's Merrill. But in all, Armstrong worked for 21 different publishers. Together with the work of two other early cover designers, Sarah Whitman and Alice C. Morse, her designs were shown at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. These three women encouraged many others to enter the field. As Barbara Beek writes in her essay, Art of the Book, Margaret Armstrong and Her Bindings, Armstrong's skill and recognition as a peer of male artists demonstrated to women that they too had a place in competitive business and could stand as equals to men in some professions. Armstrong's career was undoubtedly influenced by the example of her father, Maitland Armstrong, a diplomat and well-known stained glass artist. He served as a trustee of the New York Society Library from 1897 to 1918. His son, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, for many years the editor of Foreign Affairs, was chairman of our library from 1944 to 1957. Margaret Armstrong achieved recognition early in her career. At a Grolier Club exhibition in 1894, Armstrong was praised for her skill in adapting, combining, and creating designs which were almost flawless in excellence and made her book covers famous. By 1895, the beauty of Margaret Armstrong's cover designs had placed her as a preeminent talent in an art that publishers now valued highly. 
her style, artfully adapted to each subject, was almost always recognizable. As Harriet mentioned, her father was a stained glass artist, and admirers of her art have noticed in many of her covers a resemblance to stained glass windows. Among the over 300 cover designs she created are many that have come to represent the entire period of cloth book cover design. Armstrong's career as a book cover artist ended in the early 20th century after the color illustrated dust jacket was introduced. In the 1970s, two UCLA English professors, Charles Gullens and John Espy, rediscovered the age of the decorated cloth book cover. In their checklist of her work, they wrote that most book lovers who once see Miss Armstrong's work become totally infatuated with it. This is The Blue Flower by Henry Van Dyke, published by Scribner in 1902. Van Dyke was a writer of short stories. He was a professor of literature at Princeton, and he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. And in fact, many of his stories have a parable-like style to them. Margaret Armstrong did 12 covers for his books. And in fact, when she had moved on from being a cover designer, Scribner looked for other designers to emulate her style because it had become so synonymous with his work. The blue flower was a key symbol of German romanticism. And Van Dyck took the idea for the title story from the German philosopher Novalis, who wrote in the late 18th century. And in his story, the uh, young poet is searching for future harmony in the world, which is represented by the blue flower. And in Van Dyck's story, the blue flower represents happiness and satisfaction of the heart. And in the story, the young protagonist sees the flower transformed into the face of a beautiful young girl, just as he's being awakened from a dream. As Harriet and I delved into the texts of these books, it was very interesting to look for where we might uh, find where Margaret Armstrong had been inspired to, to design the cover. And so I have a passage to read to you from the first story. There were fields of corn filled with silk and rustling and vineyards with long rows of trimmed maple trees standing each one like an emerald goblet wreathed with vines. And in reading that and looking this cover, it was so exciting to see this beautiful green in the shape of a goblet entwined with the golden vines because it just made so clear the fact that she did read these books and found her inspiration within. Likewise, the blue flower is mentioned in the first story, the tall, clear blue flower with broad, glistening leaves. While Kathy and I were researching the books whose covers Armstrong had designed, we also came to realize that a number of the writers, popular in the 19th century, are in some instances today less well known than Margaret Armstrong herself. I'm thinking of the English writer George du Maurier. Armstrong designed the cover of his very successful novel, Trilby, and Myrtle Reed, another very popular 19th century writer for whom Armstrong designed 14 covers. Frank Richard Stockton, his dates are 1834 to 1902, was also a well-known 19th century writer, perhaps less well-known today, who enjoyed substantial success with his children's fairy tales. This is the cover of The Watchmaker's Wife, published by Scribner in 1893, a wonderfully imaginative story for grown-ups. Here you see Armstrong's intriguing cover, an interesting example of the symmetry common to decorative bindings during this period. The 23 objects lined up seem at first glance to resemble watches, but are in fact images of hot air balloons. But I won't give the plot away. Leaving you with a mystery, Stockton will slowly unravel. When Melody Sings by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, published by Dodd, Mead and Company in 1903, is the cover that was chosen to represent the exhibition on the banner in front of our library. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was born in 1872 in Ohio to parents who had been enslaved prior to the Civil War. He was our first nationally recognized African-American poet, and the title poem of this book was inspired by his mother's singing of hymns and spirituals. And the poem is about musicianship, both technical skill and soul that comes through the music of the voice. And I chose verse three to read from the poem. Paul Dunbar often wrote in dialect. 
Easy enough for folks to holler, looking at the lines and dots. When they ain't no one can sense it, and a tune comes in in spots. But for real melodious music that just strikes your heart and clings, just you stand and listen with me when Melindy sings. And again, as I read these words and looked at this cover, it looks almost as if the trellis for the flowers is like the beginning of the music, the technical part, the staff. And the brilliant red flowers and intertwining vine are the feeling of the music that can reach one's heart. Here is the cover of Italian Backgrounds by Edith Wharton, published in 1905 by Charles Scribner Sons, a book I particularly love. In a sense, we can claim Italian backgrounds as ours, for Wharton's father, George Frederick Jones, and the Armstrong family were longtime members of our library. So here are two highly gifted women, both connected to the library, whose creative work can be appreciated in this one beautiful book. For the cover, Armstrong uses a frame of colored tiles that contains a dark green rectangle. Here, a pool of verdant color hints at the mystery of Italian backgrounds. Behind the cover's spatial calm, an architectural and ecclesiastical world waits to be discovered. A peacock encircled with unfurled blue feathers perches at the four corners of the frame, symbolizing the beauty of Italy's ancient world. The Field Book of Western Wildflowers, published by G.P. Putnam Sons in 1915, has its cover design by Margaret Armstrong, its illustrations throughout by Margaret Armstrong, and the text of the book is also by Margaret Armstrong. When she was in her 40s and had finished her career as a cover designer, she was looking forward to her next venture, which was to be a trip out west to catalog the flora of the west, something that had never been done, and she was, she was going to be traveling with a botanist who was to do the write-ups for each specimen. And they were unable to go. And Margaret Armstrong was asked if she could do the write-ups. And she felt very up to the task. And she set off on this adventure for three years with a couple of traveling companions. They roamed all over the West through the deserts of Utah and New Mexico, along the Pacific in Yosemite to Mount Rainier, through the Grand Canyon. And one of the, the uh, episodes in the Grand Canyon was relayed by one of the women traveling with her to her brother, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, and he included it in his memoir, Those Days. So I have that to read to you. Margaret would appear on a ledge with a flower in her mouth and carefully make her way down using both hands, tuft by tuft, rock by rock, then not waiting to brush the dust and burrs off her clothes, begin drawing the flower, perhaps one never correctly recorded. I just love the way that this passage shows what an adventurous she was. She was a true explorer. She was doing this important work. And this book remains a seminal uh, book on the subject to this day. To continue to trace the trajectory of Margaret Armstrong's life, in October 1940, she achieved literary fame as a biographer. Now in her 70s, instead of designing covers, she herself became the cover in this instance of the Saturday Review. There was increased interest in Armstrong because in 1938, she had published the biography of Fanny Kemble, a passionate Victorian, and in 1940, Trelawney, a man's life. Both were warmly received by the critics and won recognition as notable nonfiction books. During these years, she also wrote three mysteries, one of which was Murder in Stained Glass. And she was most certainly inspired by the work of her father. And in the book, characters visit the New York Society Library. On display in the Paluzzo Family Exhibition Gallery are a number of photographs generously lent to us by the Armstrong family. Here are a few of them to share with you. Let us start with the photograph of Dan's Kammer, the ancestral family home a few miles north of Newburgh, New York. Scholar Lowell Thing has suggested that the Danskammer gardens and orchards might have fostered Margaret Armstrong's great love of nature, which reemerges in her covers in a vibrant organic line. As a footnote, you might be interested to know that five ionic pillars from Danskammer's portico are on display on the grounds of Storm King Art Center. Outdoor life was a very important part of the Armstrong family life. And 
her father, Maitland Armstrong, wrote in his memoir, Day Before Yesterday, of a summer that the family spent in Newburyport, Massachusetts in 1875 when Margaret was eight years old. And he painted outside every day while Margaret's mother read aloud from the life of Goethe and from Darwin. And it was this summer that Margaret had her first painting lessons from a local artist. Just to the right of Dan Skimmer, we see the picture of Margaret as a little girl. To her right, we see the circulation record for the Armstrong family during parts of 1894 and 1895 for the New York Society Library. Then Margaret is a young woman. And to her right, we see West 10th Street at the time where the family lived. They had a house on one side of the street and Maitland Armstrong's studio was on the other. In fact, Maitland Armstrong was a member of a lively international artistic circle that included Augustus saint gaudens Louis Comfort Tiffany, and John Lafarge. This circle of artists certainly influenced Margaret's own creative life. Just below the picture of Margaret as a young woman, we see her parents in costume at the time that they were living in Rome. Uh, her father was made consul to the Papal States in 1869, when Margaret was two years old. And the family lived in Rome on the Via Sistina in the third floor of a palazzo with frescoes on the interior walls. So Margaret was always surrounded by art and by books from, from an early age. And her parents are in costume as for a portrait uh, for a charity event that was held for victims of the overflow of the Tiber River at the time that they were living there. Uh, there were many victims and much property loss. And then as now, charity events were held for, uh, to raise money for people who suffered from the flood. On the left, in the middle, we see the Armstrong family. And Margaret is seated on the first row on the right, surrounded by her siblings and her parents. They're all looking very happy to be out of doors and to be together. Now we come to a photograph we cannot show you because it is on display in the fourth case in the gallery. Let me describe it to you as best I can because it captures in a grainy black and white image, Margaret Armstrong towards the end of her life. Time has passed and the enchanting child soberly looking out at the world from the family flat on the Via Sistina is now living as she has been for many years in New York City. Two elderly ladies, Margaret and Helen, wearing charming little hats are walking up Fifth Avenue. There is no date, but we can be sure this picture was taken during World War II. The picture is slightly blurred, but the women, captured in slow motion, continue to walk past us. Now they are leaving the picture frame and perhaps walking together to the New York Society Library. Kathy and I look forward to meeting you in person soon again at the library. But in the meantime, you can find more images of Armstrong's decorated book covers in our online gallery listed under the virtual NYSL on the homepage. Thank you for joining us. And as Harriet said, we look forward to seeing you back at the library.